So Joel got his PhD, like all four people, um, in plant biology from Case Western Reserve University. And then following that, he did two postdocs where he investigated um, how, how gene expression in plants can be controlled by interactions with the environment. And so his expertise in gene expression led him to a position with, at a um, institute that was set up in San Diego, um, whose name I actually, Tori, Tori Mesa, right. Tori Mesa, um, and after Tori Mesa uh, was, was kind of closed down, he became a group leader at um, Diversa, which later became Verenium, and Verenium later became BP. And he's uh, transitioned from the plant arena into the area of fungal and microbial genomics and metagenomics, and uh, in particular, gene expression and how genes get expressed well. And if you find that I'm expressing myself better than I usually am, it's because I asked him for advice on how I could best express myself. <laughs> um, and so here to give a talk much better than that joke is Joel. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so I'd like to start off by thanking all of you for uh, the opportunity to come up here and talk to you all uh, about, uh, as uh, my title is, uh, Improving Microorganisms for Robust Low-Cost Lignocellulosic Process. Um, which is uh, basically a fancy talk, if you will, for um, talking about engineering microbes for biofuels applications. So um, I'd just like to kind of set the stage today. So my talk's going to be a little bit different from the normal uh, data dump or uh, research result discussion. And really, the, my goal for today is to talk with you uh, and give you some perspective uh, from uh, my view on the world down in San Diego uh, with the work that we're doing engineering microbes for biofuels applications, but in particular with the focus on what are the challenges that, that we're dealing with um, as we kind of face the more commercial aspect of things, and if you will, to, to give you all some, some ideas about some areas where uh, you all um, might have the ability to contribute and to help us solve these challenges. And I'd just like to highlight, please, anytime, uh, feel free to interrupt, ask questions. I definitely enjoy a more interactive presentation rather than me simply lecturing uh, to all of you. So with that introduction, so uh, for today, um, basically I'll give a short overview of biofuels and then BP Biofuels Global Technology Center, as we're known in San Diego, mostly to make sure that we're all on the same page for then the following slides that we're all going to talk more about the engineering microbes. So I expect that some of this at the beginning will be um, a repeat for some of you, but for those of you um, who haven't heard it before, um, it's to help you get some context for what I'll then be talking about in terms of what we're dealing with engineering microbes and, and really the context for some of our challenges. So why biofuels? I mean, it's a pretty, pretty basic topic these days in the sense of uh, I think everyone in this room is probably yes biofuels are a good thing, but to give you all some perspective also in the sense of thinking about energy security, um, climate change, rural development are uh, a variety of, of uh, forces that are motivating companies like BP, scientists like yourselves, uh, to really engage in, in developing biofuels for this planet. Um, energy security is obviously things like, from a U.S. perspective, being able to uh, have energy production here in the U.S. Um, that all, also applies in the rural development area as far as uh, a reason for us to be engaged in developing biofuels is uh, the benefits it'll bring to rural development here in the U.S. And uh, I, I grew up in the Midwest in Ohio, and, and when I've gone, I went to a grain ethanol plant back in 2007 in South Dakota, and, and it was really amazing to sit there in the, the control room of this fermentation plant in Watertown, South Dakota, and talk with these guys and talk, you know, sit there and look on the computer screens and, and talk with them. You know, I don't think any of them had a college education, but we could sit there and talk about yeast and fermentation and enzymes. And to me, it was really striking to think about some of my family who are farmers in Ohio and, and think about how um, this really is transitional for our country in the sense of bringing technology into the heartland in a way that, that we haven't done before. Climate change, obviously, CO2, uh, I think we all appreciate that biofuels, I should point out, biofuels done, done in the right way um, will improve our, our CO2 situation and uh, hopefully reduce climate change issues. Um, so one reason from a BP perspective, too, in terms of looking at biofuels um, is to look at, at 
market opportunities. And so um, this is a graph uh, on the y-axis. We have volume in millions of barrels per day of transportation fuel. And the x-axis is time in years. And so what's displayed here is, uh, and this is an international energy agency uh, graphic, uh, basically representing how the uh, opportunities are out there for biofuels in the coming decades. And so what you can see, uh, let's see if we do it this way. So what you can see is that on this lower line is basically the value of biofuels penetration um, as a function of uh, kind of first generation biofuels, so corn ethanol and vegetable oil into soybeans whereas the upper line then represents the opportunities for advanced biofuels. So that's lignocellulosic biofuels from my perspective, and then things like uh, uh, biobutanol, et cetera. And then this light green line here represents the, the values uh, that are dictated by uh, governmental regulation here in the US and in the EU. So what you can see is that as, as the years go along, that there's the opportunity for, uh, you know, 10 million barrels per day of biofuels. Uh, so from uh, a green perspective, that's in replacement of petroleum. From a, a commercial standpoint, it's uh, 10 million barrels worth of sales per day. So from a BP perspective, this is a pretty straightforward number to then talk about how much is uh, appropriate to invest in biofuels. And so I think you can see that there's actually pretty large numbers here. And so again, Good things for the planet, but then also good things from a business perspective. So I just want to emphasize again from a, a BP perspective, one of the key things is that uh, you know, BP got into this business back in 2006. As the graphic here stipulates, BP has already invested simply in biofuels $2.2 billion uh, in the past, was that five years. Um, but one of the reasons, one of the or several of the key components from a BP perspective is that for biofuels to be uh, successful, uh, or not successful, but to work from a BP perspective is clearly we have to develop biofuels that are low cost. So, so coming up with biofuels just for the sake of doing biofuels doesn't work unless you do it in an economical fashion in terms of uh, scale of production. Uh, clearly, it needs to be low carbon. I mean, again, from BP, it's pretty straightforward to, to know that BP understands how to sell uh, gasoline and diesel and other petroleum products. So really what we're talking about here are truly uh, differentiated alternatives, so low carbon transportation fuels. And in that same way, from a BP perspective, it needs to be scalable. So for us to succeed in San Diego, it's not simply can we develop a technology that will work in one little niche setting or one little niche application, but is it a technology that we can truly deploy around the planet and that we can scale up to, again, reach those large numbers of 10 million barrels per day that we saw in the previous graphic. And then clearly, it's got to be sustainable. We already see from first generation ethanol production from uh, corn and soybean, or biodiesel production from vegetable oil, that not done the right way creates political backlash in terms of the public saying, well, wait a minute, now my tortillas are doubled in price because you're making corn ethanol. That doesn't work for me. And so, uh, again, the notion then is, as we develop these technologies, they have to be sustainable in a way that the current first-generation biofuels aren't. So here I'd just like to outline from, uh, again, the BP biofuels perspective. Um, what's demonstrated here, or displayed here, is our strategy in terms of um, working in technology and then also developing businesses. So from a practical standpoint, what we see is that we've got the different feedstocks that we're working on on the left side. So we're working in sugarcane to ethanol right now in Brazil. And as some of you may know, uh, we recently announced acquisition of more uh, sugarcane to ethanol uh, plants in Brazil. Um, and then uh, we're also uh, finishing construction of a plant to convert, although it's not uh, second generation, but uh, grain to wheat grain to ethanol in, in uh, the UK through a joint venture called Vivergo. And then in, here in the US, we're focused in on energy grasses. Um, uh, obviously, that makes sense uh, from the, everyone's perspective here. The notion then is to take all these feedstocks and convert them into uh, what I would call cheap sugar, but then to have that sugar available for fermentation to then develop biofuels commercially, bio, bioethanol here in the US to start with. Um, then we have a joint venture in biobutanol with DuPont called Butamax, excuse me, 
Um, and then uh, a biodiesel um, joint development agreement with a company called um, Martec that's now owned by uh, DSM um, to develop biodiesel where uh, they're engineering microbes to produce uh, a diesel molecule from glucose. So again, uh, then working with a variety of feedstocks, coming up with the uh, conversion process or depolymerization to convert those feedstocks into the simple sugar and then developing and optimizing the conversion technologies to create these fuels. So from my perspective, you could label all of this as really biocatalysts. So from a, a talking with the greater BP, so some of the petroleum people, the engineers, some of the alternative energy people, um, they really seem to uh, appreciate when we use the term biocatalyst, that makes sense to them. And so realistically, what we're talking about are biocatalysts for converting the feedstocks into the simple sugars, and biocatalysts to convert those simple sugars into the uh, fuel molecules. And in this case, biocatalyst refers to both organisms and enzymes. Uh, just to kind of give you some perspective, so here's, uh, uh, so San Diego, I think you heard a talk from Dave Nunn back in January outlining how everything transpired with the, the conversion of Diversa into Verenium, Verenium uh, biofuels business being acquired by BP Biofuels, and, and we are now called the Global Technology Center for BP Biofuels. Um, that makes us the seventh technology center for the, for the broader BP. And I should emphasize uh, for my friends who are still at Verenium, Verenium still exists as an industrial enzyme company, still uh, making products and selling them into the industrial sector. Um, so then just kind of giving you more perspective, here's a picture of uh, the group of us down in San Diego. This is the front of our building. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, uh, biofuels technology in general, so we have R&D going on at what we call GTC for short, the Global Technology Center in San Diego. We also have an R&D team in Hull, UK, which is where the grain ethanol and biobutanol work is being done also. We then have our demonstration plant that came over from Verenium uh, that's in Jennings, Louisiana. And we have a uh, biobutanol demonstration plant that is, I think they're finishing construction in Hull, UK, which is on the northeast coast of, of England. Uh, and then commercial plants, as I mentioned, we, we own and just bought more um, uh, cane, sugar cane to ethanol plants in Brazil in a couple different states. And then we have that grain to ethanol plant that is being finished in the UK. And then we have our cellulosic ethanol plant that uh, we expect to break ground probably the end of this year in Highlands, Florida, although we've already started construction, as we call it, of the farm for growing out energy cane and napier grass um, in Florida. And for those of you who don't know, on the plant side, with these grasses, it, it takes years to propagate and build out the fields because you literally are cutting the cane stems and shoving them in the ground to get new plants. And so to end up, uh, our target with the Highlands plant is to have about 20,000 acres of uh, some sort of grass or cane uh, when the plant's operational in probably 2013, 2014. And so we're on a schedule of uh, them building out to get to that 20,000 acres. Uh, ground is not broken on construction of the plant, but uh, so we're working with a, a family farm down there called the uh, Sykes Brothers Farm. Um, and so the idea, they've sold us, I think, the land for the plant in the middle of their farm. And so then they're, they're growing out the uh, energy cane and napier grass. And so the construction on the farm has started. Um, but we're finishing up uh, what we call the design package for that first commercial plant. And then uh, our plans are to do uh, five more uh, commercial plants in the southeastern United States, probably in the next two to three years. And I think in the next 10 years to end up with about 20 to 25 plants in the southeastern US doing cellulosic ethanol. Um, so again, uh, with the view towards setting the stage for the rest of my talk, uh, focusing on engineered microbes, I just wanted to go through uh, the, the different aspects of what we have in the Technology Center in San Diego. And so I, again, for some of you may have heard about some of this in the past. So one of the ideas is that in technology that was brought over from Verenium, we have a uh, patented process for accessing biodiversity, so going out in the environment, collecting samples, bring those back to the lab, isolating DNA and microorganisms from those samples, and then screening for 
uh, valuable, in this case, biocatalysts in terms of uh, cellulases or other enzymes and then microorganisms. To be able to really um, make use of these uh, biodiversity samples, we've also developed high throughput screening technologies that we also brought over into BP Biofuels. And some of those technologies give us the ability to screen upwards of a billion or more samples per day um, in looking for those uh, optimal catalysts. Um, in addition, then, we also have what we call directed evolution technology that allows us to evolve those catalysts, in this case, specifically enzymes, uh, to be even better at the job that, that we've picked out for them. Uh, we also then have synthetic biology program. Uh, in this case, uh, you can kind of pick your favorite uh, uh, euphemism de jour as far as what synthetic biology um, versus molecular biology versus uh, genetic engineering, uh, you name it. Really, from my perspective, it's talking about heterologous um, overexpression of proteins and pathways in microorganisms. And then within San Diego, we have the ability to then scale up those processes in terms of fermentation up to the 500 liter scale. And I don't really have it here, but, and then one of the notions is that the the technologies that we develop and optimize in San Diego, um, we then test out uh, up to the 500 liter scale and prepare uh, transfer technology documents to then send the, the processes, the organisms, the fermentation conditions to our demo plant in Louisiana, where it then gets tested. The demo plant in Louisiana is rated at 1.4 million gallons per year. Um, I think the fermentation tanks are in the 20 to 30,000 gallon uh, range and so that's our, our demonstration plant and we estimate that's about a 1 20th scale of the commercial plant So the first one in Florida will be about 36 million gallons and then subsequent plants after that will probably be larger in the 70 to 80 million gallon per year uh, range uh, So again to, to help give some context to what I want to talk about in terms of problems We're dealing with with microorganisms. I think some of you may have seen this uh, graphic before this is our LC ethanol process as it's currently running in Louisiana and as we expect it to be at our first commercial plant in Florida. So, um, you know, you start here with the farm, uh, growing the biomass, bringing the biomass then into what we call uh, solids handling, uh, literally a conveyor belt. Uh, the cane material gets processed through a liquid uh, acid hydrolysis and steam explosion pretreatment method. Um, the acid hydrolysis then uh, uh, hydro uh, hydrolyzes the hemicellulose and the cellulose comes out into the liquid uh, fraction and then we can take that liquid and, and or that material and run it through a liquid solid separation with our liquid being pulled off with the C5 as we call it and we run a fermentation on the C5 uh, metabolizing organism. The solids then essentially contain our cellulose at that point. We do on-site enzyme production and mix those enzymes with another fermentative organism that does a C6 uh, simultaneous sacarification fermentation. Um, those two beers, as we call them, are then pulled together into one beer well. And then that material, the ethanol, is pulled off via distillation process, pretty standard technology, and then uh, purified up to fuel grade uh, ethanol and taken off to the blender. Um, then we do another liquid solid separation, pull off as much water as we can, and then the solids are used to then power a boiler to generate steam to run the plant. So from a practical, oh, and then the other point here again is uh, those pressures about low cost, making sure that we can run this process as cheaply as possible. Um, also uh, focusing in on carbon footprints, scalability and sustainability, as you'll see more in a bit. So for the rest of the talk, I'd really like you to keep in mind that we've got fermentation or microorganisms that are engineered um, to produce enzymes that are engineered to do C5 fermentations and that are doing C6 fermentations. And so those are the microbes I'll be talking about. Yeah? Uh, what, sort of, I mean, what size of your, I guess, the capacity you put in now for your, I guess, steam explosion and acid hydrolysis? Uh, I know at some point it gets sized into four to six inch billets. Um, and then I think that gets shredded, uh, but I'm not that familiar with exactly what's going on at the, the beginning part here. But that's actually one of the areas where there's a fair amount of research going on because, uh, again, none of this stuff is, is running right now at commercial scale in the sense of there's not, a, there's not umpteen plants already out there that people know exactly this is how you do it. 
uh, properly. So to a certain extent, we're testing a lot of different technologies. And for instance, trying to figure out how do you store biomass year round. Because as some of you may know, uh, whether it's in, so in this case, we're in Louisiana and Florida for our plants. Um, cane is not available year round. So you actually, uh, I think it's a uh, eight or nine month season that you harvest. And so there's actually several months where we'll have uh, material that sits around. And so then that'll get processed through, this, through the front end of the plant. And exactly how you store that is, a, is an open question as far as what's the best way to do that. Is the, is the plant designed to be completely fixed or is it more like a modular model where you can exchange change the pentose fermentation to something else that seems more cost effective in three or four years. So will that, that, that sort of new technology be only adopted in future plants rather than? Um, I think it's mixed. So I know, uh, so in some cases, uh, the way, so particularly with what we call CP1, commercial plant one, the, the design work for CP1 um, is basically a, a little bit bigger or a little bit over-engineered to be able to deal with uh, modify or innovations that come along. In some cases, I know, for instance, at our demo plant, we've swapped in new tanks. Um, uh, in other cases, I think the way the plant gets built, you're kind of stuck if you want to change certain parts because of the way everything in three dimensional and four dimensions, including time, have to be organized. If you're going to replace it, you almost have to tear down half the plant. So at that point, maybe just build a new one. So I th I, the bottom line is, I don't know for sure. I know in some cases there is a notion that we will be able to switch in new technology, but there's also that aspect of building more plants, is that the newer plants will have better technology. Yeah? How do you take care of the acid that's So acid in the sense of what's not used or the acid that goes into this process? So the acid that goes into this process, it, it's not listed here. There's a neutralization step um, that um, basically brings it from a low pH up to a higher pH uh, before it goes into the C5 fermentation. So we actually have a lime pretreatment step that neutralizes the acid. Oh, it's very important. And in fact, we'll talk some about that in a later part of my talk. But yeah, so, so this whole, there's actually should be another bubble here of that neutralization and what we call detox or detoxification. So exactly, there's treatments that we do to uh, reduce the amount of inhibitors. Um, but in addition, so there's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a uh, chicken and the egg in the sense of um, how much effort do you put in your detox chemistry and, and engineering? And how much do you try to build that into your organism? And uh, again, at this point, uh, to be fairly honest, we don't have a commercial plant running. So right now, you know, I can tell you what, what our plans are for CP1. And in terms of you know, we've got some detox going on here. And then we're also focused making sure that our organism is, is robust enough to tolerate the toxins that come in. But um, as we'll talk in a moment, that's actually, I think, going to be a challenge of running a plant year round hasn't happened yet. Um, at this scale. So what we'll encounter, um, we don't know exactly yet. And so that, that'll be one of the points to talk about in a bit. Thanks for all the questions, by the way. Um, so for the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus in on more of what I and, and, and my group uh, in San Diego work on. And, and so again, the notion is coming back to this idea of biocatalysts. So in, in our world, we really view things a little bit more simply than the, the schema I just showed you. So for us, it's really talking about converting biomass through deep, what I will call depolymerization into simple sugars. And so having a biocatalyst that does that, and then having a biocatalyst or two that then take those simple sugars and convert them into biofuel. And so for, for the rest of today's talk, I'll be going, focusing in on these two perspectives, so the depolymerization step and then the, the conversion step. Oh, uh, I forgot about this part. So the one thing I wanted to talk about, so I'm going to talk about some of our challenges around engineering microbes. One thing I wanted to touch on before we get into more of the, the process-specific things is to talk about heterologous expression. Um, in the talks I've had today with several of the grad students and faculty members, which I really enjoyed, 
Uh, this came up uh, time and again. And I just wanted to kind of highlight that um, optimization of heterologous expression is definitely an issue for us. Um, but it's, I would say it's definitely something that, that we've got a good handle on. I think a lot of people do. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of quickly go through it to give you a sense of how we're handling heterologous uh, expression. And, and so realistically, what I'm talking about is that we've got a low yield of something, essentially a protein, an activity. And so for us, um, trying to optimize that heterologous expression really starts off with asking a simple question, do we have a quality issue or a quantity issue? Are we making plenty of protein, but it's just not active? Are we not making enough protein, et cetera? And so you can, you can run through these various questions then on the quantity side. And really, it's, it's by asking and answering these questions that you really get a sense of, um, are you talking about a quality versus quantity issue? So uh, from our standpoint, then trying to pin down these bottlenecks, what's been limiting us? Is it growth conditions, transcription? Uh, for those of you in the microbial field who know this, copy number, so how many copies of our heterologous gene are inside the cell? And then obviously things like codon usage. And protein quality, uh, is, it, is it the right size? Is it intact? Um, um, and is it in the right place? So if we've designed a secreted enzyme, are we in fact finding it outside the cell as opposed to just piling up inside the cell? Running through, I don't see, I will, you know, the green kind of comes through. So you know, obvious approaches to these sorts of questions, uh, optimizing our growth conditions in San Diego using shake flasks and uh, similar bioreactors to what I saw here in the, in the Calvin lab, looking at RNA quantity and quality, um, looking at copy number with PCR and southern blots, and optimizing our codon usage are things that we do fairly routinely. And then from a protein standpoint, it was kind of funny. Everything is simply doing protein gels, western blots, and proteomics at, at every step of the way. So all of these things are things we do routinely, and to a certain extent, we can take it as a given that these aren't issues for the most cases, as we'll be talking a little bit. And one other thing I want, did want to point out, we also see the value in addressing these basic questions, but then also once we've addressed those and we still have limitations in, in accumulation of our proteins, we can then also ask, are there kind of non-obvious bottlenecks and really taking more of a systems approach with RNA profiling, proteomics, metabolomics, to begin to ask those questions of, can we find a non-obvious bottleneck? And I was sharing with somebody today the example where people did this in, one, in uh, a fungus called A. niger, where they were able to uncover an unfolded protein response issue by overexpressing a particular heterologous enzyme had really uh, turned on this pathway. And by then being able to go in and direct their host modifications to address that pathway change, they're able to overcome their expression problems. So moving back to this version of life. Um, so I'll touch on depolymerization problems and then conversion problems. So depolymerization challenges, as I call them, um, really what we're talking about, and I'll go into more de detail with each of these with some examples. We're talking about how do we deal with media costs? Um, enzyme yield versus time, uh, basically how much protein are we making, how fast? And then, of course, enzyme quality, and then robustness in our fermentation organism. So as we've built out our recombinant organism um, and we grow it in a fermenter, um, basically how well does it do time and again, and how well does it do during scale up? So zooming in, when I'm talking about media costs, one of the things that, that uh, may not be obvious uh, in the research lab, so one of the things we have to deal with is scale. So what works at three liters in terms of the cost of a raw material? Um, we have to figure out how does that work at 200,000 liters. So that'll be the size of one of several uh, uh, fungal fermentation tanks at our first commercial plant. So something that, that's cost effective at three liters um, uh, may not be cost effective at, at 200,000 liters. And so that limits what we're able to work with in the sense of developing a final process. The other thing that um, may not be obvious with raw materials in, at, at this large scale is then dealing with what's called price inflation. So as an example, we need to use these raw materials, and typically they're fairly crude, um, throughout the year. Well, there are actually, we've already seen some instances of these raw material qualities changing throughout the year. And so a batch of, uh, I forget, like a corn syrup, let's say, when you're buying by the tank car, each tank car over the, the course of 12 months may not have the exact same quality. And so that or price in some cases. And then in addition, one of the things that we're con considering then is as we build out these commercial plants, raw materials that were cheap 
uh, when we started using them may actually turn out to be expensive once we're actually up and running. So we've estimated that with our first commercial plant, once that's up and running, it'll make us the largest enzyme producer in North America. And we're on target to do five in the next several years. So you can see where um, once we're actually up and running, materials that right now are abundant and cheap may actually become fairly um, expensive in, in a short time. So for the rest of the talk, I'll be doing these types of slides and then also touching on possible solutions. And so these are things I've thought about. And, and again, my hope is that um, I'll give you guys some ideas of things that you might be thinking about as far as solutions that you might find to work on yourselves. And so in this case, possible solutions that I see to these issues. Uh, so as some of you may know, when you're growing the fungus, you need to, uh, to get it to produce cellulases. You need to include an inducer to get the cells to produce those cellulases. So it may be that we can come up with deregulated expression of cellulases so we're not needing to add an inducer anymore, which would help reduce our media costs. Um, or maybe it's just coming up with a cheaper inducer than the, the types of materials we're using now. One of the things from the fermentation science standpoint is being able to use fully uh, defined materials in the, in the media. So by that, I mean having essentially very simple carbon and nitrogen sources and essentially mineral salts. So again, for, for some of these fungal fermentations, we're dealing with more complex media that, that basically bring in those issues around quality because you're dealing with uh, essentially undefined uh, components, so some sort of ag waste or whatever that you don't know exactly what's in there. And then one of the other solutions, yeah. Um, well, Mm. Do you think that you're anyone's going to actually use an organic nitrogen source? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I mean, right now, I think we're using uh, ammonium hydroxide as pH control, and then that provides some of the nitrogen. And I just don't know off the top of my head about the exact media components for our, our commercial fungal preps. But yeah, that's, that's another good point, that nitrogen then can be uh, quite expensive. Um, and then another thing that people have talked about is this notion of enzyme recycling. So as a way to make it cheaper is that we can just reuse the enzymes, which would be nice, but there are also a lot of issues around that. Uh, so yield versus time, what am I talking about? Again, scaling up. So what, what our titers might look like or yield in a small scale fermenter needs to be essentially that same level at, at large scale. And so we may be running into issues about how well those uh, those methods actually do work when we're running them at 200,000 liters. Uh, in this case, where we're, we're asking a fungus to make a lot of enzyme for us, we also have to worry about, again, getting back to carbon and nitrogen issues, about where all that's going in terms of cell mass versus secreted enzyme. Um, secretion efficiency is an obvious one in terms of uh, making sure that we get as much protein outside of the cells quickly as possible. The other thing that comes up is then we're dealing with a, a complex cocktail of a variety of enzymes coming out of the fungal cell that we're then feeding into our, our SSF. And one of the issues may be that as when we're working at large scale and we're working over time, we may be seeing changes to the quality of that cocktail, that enzyme cocktail. And then in addition, uh, that enzyme cocktail profile may be changing as we deal with process upsets because we're running at these ginormous scales. For all of this, from my perspective, one of the ways to approach this might be to, not might be, would be to get an improved understanding of exactly how the environment and the cell are interacting with each other, and then seeing, being able to understand those interactions and their effects on the fungal gene expression and secretion. So again, taking a more knowledge-based approach rather than simply reacting to the problems we're dealing with. Uh, Post-translational modification, uh, enzyme quality. This is something, again, that came up multiple times today. Uh, we all know um, as we, enzymes get secreted, they have the chance to be uh, modified, usually through glycosylation, sometimes phosphorylation and methylation. We also have issues like proteases. So we may not see a protease a, a problem at small scale, but when you've got an organism growing at the, a very large scale, you may run into those issues. Uh, possible solutions here then are basically being able to uh, have a controlled or directed post-translational modification system 
and uh, again, well-characterized uh, secretome, as I call it, and protease deficient host systems to address some of these problems. Again, possible solutions. Maybe you guys can come up with other ones. Robustness um, is really talking about um, dealing with something, uh, as people were calling it the other day at work, um, taking our microorganisms and our fermentation process and putting it outside. And so really what we're talking about is now, again, when you're running a 200,000 liter tank on a day, day in and day out basis, um, it's quite likely that we're going to see changes, as I mentioned before, in the quality of our media components. So what we're all used to buying from Sigma or Fisher Scientific or whatever and having that lot to lot uh, 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 similarity it may not work so well when you're talking about tank cars and um, dealing with, we already know it doesn't work that well. Um, and so it's, it's going to be those challenges uh, and, and, uh, that we'll have to deal with. Feedstock, in this case, we're talking about plant material coming in. We already know that I think most people here appreciate that over the year you see uh, different uh, materials accumulating inside a plant. And then how some of those feedstock uh, effects may change the cocktail profile. Um, again, possible solutions to me really all revolve around understanding better our, our system and understanding what, how the environment um, changes and how those changes can af do affect our microorganisms and our engineered uh, systems to, uh, again, be able to uh, build in the, the, the level of sophistication that, that we're going to need to overcome these challenges. So changing gears and focusing now on the, basically the little yeast guys based on this micrograph and looking at conversion. So, what are the issues around um, our engineered organisms eating the sugar and making the biofuel? Uh, pretty much a lot of the same as what we saw for the fungal enzymes, but in this case, we also have conversion efficiency. So in this case, we're looking at small molecules and our biofuel. Um, at some point right now, as I laid it out for you, we're doing our C5 and C6 fermentations in two separate tanks with two separate organisms. Clearly, at some point, we will want to be able to do that uh, function in the same cell in one fermentation. So uh, we'll go into that in more detail. And then just like with the fungus, uh, robustness is definitely a challenge. So talking about media costs, it's really just the same things I went over for the fungus. So we're talking about at scale, um, having something uh, working at 200,000 liters economically is going to, going to be a challenge. And again, dealing with raw materials uh, and uh, one possible solution is dealing with um, uh, completely defined media. Uh, conversion challenges here, it's really about maximizing carbon flow into our product, our fuel. In some cases, uh, it means that we'll want some of the carbon, obviously, to go into biomass production, but eventually we'll need to be able to have that uh, carbon flowing into the product. Uh, and here, as we were talking earlier, there's also going to be challenges with the inhibitors uh, coming in with our feedstock and our hydrolysate that uh, whatever comes out of our, our detox neutralization, it all goes into our fermenters. So whatever materials happen to be in that feedstock or in that hydrolysate um, are going to get thrown out our microorganisms. Since for the C6 you're looking at an SSF configuration, how much focus do you have to put on dealing with just being in non-optimal conditions, both on the enzyme and on the cell side? I, I mean not focus on non-optimal. Because for the enzymes, you're obviously oh. not running Sure. Um, you may be running, I assume you're running at about pH 5, and you might have found an organism that works great there for C6, yep. but if, you, if you're using, you know, more like yeast, it works, but it's not its best. Right, and exact, and, you know, again, that's, if you will, for me as a research scientist, I see that as opportunities. And, but you're right. I mean, that's, that's, again, one of the challenges of figuring out, you know, as things stand right now with a, a typical filamentous fungal enzyme cocktail that has, let's say, a, a 50 degrees C temperature optimum and a fermentative microorganism that has a, a growth temperature optimum well below that, exactly, we're at suboptimal conditions. And, and I was talking uh, earlier today about can we come up with thermophilic yeast? Um, and that's definitely, I would say, something that, again, from a research standpoint, um, you can, you know, I, I see this as uh, job security. I mean, there's a lot of things that we want to be able to do. Um, and, and again, it's for us right now in San Diego, for BP Biofuels, it's about our first commercial plant and getting that operational. And, and the expectation then is that on my part and other people's is that we'll have these feedbacks to then say, all right, we've got CP1 off the ground. 
How do we make it better? And so that's a prime example of can we come up with a, an, uh, for the SSF, of an enzyme cocktail and fermentative organism that are matched from a pH and temperature standpoint. Uh, conversion, so thinking about bringing both, both uh, C5 and C6 fermentations into one cell. Uh, one of the challenges there when you talk about large scale is then, again, figuring out what parts of what we do at small scale uh, might be impacted by going up to these, these huge fermentation sizes and uptakes of the sugars uh, in an equivalent fashion may be one of the issues. Dioxy, for those of you who are not familiar with the term that refers to using up one of the sugars before the other, may become an issue um, where it wasn't present at smaller scale. Um, enzyme cofactor availability, again, those of you in the field know, appreciate that the enzymes uh, used to break, uh, convert C5 and C6 into uh, ethanol are slightly different and have different cofactor requirements. A solution in this case, from my standpoint, is are there ways that we can evolve these enzymes and pathways to be more compatible? Um, and then uh, getting close to wrapping up. So thinking about then from a robustness standpoint in terms of our, our ethanol production, again, dealing with tolerance. Uh, 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 pr tolerance to process upsets is going to be huge. And it's just something that, we're, that there are things that we're already learning from our, our work at our uh, demonstration scale in Jennings, Louisiana. Um, and those things are things like uh, seasonal changes in the media quality, temperature and pH fluctuations. So um, some of you may appreciate southern Louisiana in the summertime is hot. Um, you may not have absolute cooling all the time. So we run into issues where uh, you, you have a set point of 35 degrees Celsius for your fermentation. Well, guess what? It actually got up to 40. Well, is that a problem? Uh, maybe. And so again, being able to, to engineer in s some of the robustness to deal with that is part of what uh, we all need to be working on, or what, what some topics for us to work on. And, and again, it comes back to then that, that topic of basically, uh, what can we learn about these systems that'll help us be able to build in that, that robustness? So to summarize what I've been talking about today, um, just real quickly, you know, from a commercial scale uh, perspective, uh, what we're talking about um, here is, um, you know, considerations around media components um, that the, have to be low cost and the quality is going to vary because we're basically dealing with the cheapest raw material you can find usually. Uh, one of the other challenges that may not be apparent is that none of this has ever been scaled up to, to the levels we're talking about. So there may be things we just haven't even anticipated yet. And again, because you're dealing with these very large uh, systems, process controls that we're all used to in the lab setting uh, may not be as, uh, as tight as we would like in the large scale. And we're just going to have to plan on what those, that there will be deviations from the, from the run plan. And again, heterologous expression uh, is tricky in the best of conditions. And again, when you throw it out into the outdoors, as we call it, um, heterologous expression could actually uh, be affected. And all of this, to me, really leads us to, down to the final equation, as I've listed here, which from my background in plant biology is a fairly standard uh, terminology, G by E. It's so really talking about how genetics and the environment interact, in this case, to give us the, the product of gene expression, whether it's our saccharifying enzymes or our um, uh, ethanol-producing enzymes. And so from my perspective, really what I see is that um, the more we can understand about our, our systems, the, the more likely we are to be able to build the robustness that we're going to need at large scale. So with that, I'd like to wrap up. Uh, I'd just like to highlight, as some of you may not know, we are hiring down in San Diego right now. Um, if you visit this website, you'll find out about some of the jobs. But unfortunately, BP took down some of the jobs yesterday. So um, I do have a listing of all the job positions we have. Um, and um, I'd just like to thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer your questions now. Well, 
I, I, I think we, we'd be open to licensing in, but uh, I guess I thought you were kind of going to what's called um, on-site production versus distribution. Um, so as an example, Novozymes, I know, has that model where they've, they've built or they're finishing their plant in Nebraska, and the notion is that they're then going to ship this material out. I think our estimate for our, our CP1, um, so that's a 36 million gallon per year plant, and I think we're estimating that we will use on the order of 10 million gallons of enzyme per year. So that would mean that we would have to have Novozyme ship us 10 million gallons per year. So you can kind of guesstimate as far as the fuel costs, et cetera, that um, that's not really going to work. So one notion, though, is that, and that's something that as an industry that we're going to have to see how this plays out, is that there may actually be that that notion of a single enzyme production site that then distributes to nearby plants. But you know, right now, even at 20 plants around uh, the southern United States, we really aren't going to have the density to be able to build a, a larger production system. But you know, between us, uh, Shell, Codexus, uh, DuPont, Danisco, you know, we'll see. So there, there may it may be over time that that we actually end up uh, being able to do more of a uh, distributed network system. You don't think that the enzyme can be dewatered and sold as a pellet or as, a, as it, some sort of dry formulation? Uh, as a dry formulation, it's a good question. So the cost with dewatering um, uh, can be considerable, and I just don't know when you're talking about that large of volumes um, what that looks like. So to to you know, 10 million gallons per year. I forget. I don't know what that would be per day, but um, there are issues around that. I know from our Verenium work, Verenium does enzyme production in Mexico City and then ships worldwide and ships as liquid uh, because the dewatering or, or like spray drying um, is just too expensive because you actually use a lot of energy to drive off that moisture. John, did you have a question? I wondered what about just water consumption. Water consumption, it's considerable. Yeah, so I, I actually, to be honest, I don't know the number for our, our CP1, but that is one of the requirements for where we're siting plants is where there's abundant fresh water. Um, somewhere somewhere in, in, the, in the either science or nature biotech, someone recently had a pretty good article where they're outlining some of these issues as far as exactly how much water you might need and, and how much water there is around the planet. And I, it, it's, it's astounding how much water a plant needs, but it's equally astounding, at least in some locations, how much fresh water is available, how much excess fresh water. Obviously, and it, all of us have been spent much time here in California. I appreciate it's not California. But I think you know southern United States, along the Mississippi, things like that, you may actually, the total amount sounds like a large number, but then when you actually do the math for how much water flows on the Mississippi, um, it's really, you know, um, it's insignificant. Well, not insignificant, but it's, it's manageable. So all the fungal biomass actually gets dumped into here so we don't spin out the supernatant. So everything goes into here. Everything from here goes into the beer well. We drive off the ethanol. And then the, the liquid, uh, so one of the things that we're working on hard is water reclamation. So how much water can we recycle from this step? And then the solids, which include all the dead cells from both fermentations, uh, all three fermentations, um, end up in the boiler. And so that's actually, from a, a regulatory standpoint here in the US, an important point, because uh, we've got recombinant organisms, and EPA doesn't want those getting out. So we basically have to have, if you will, a closed system that um, all of our material has to, all of our recombinant material needs to get destroyed. I don't know. Sounds like a great research question. I guess it's more about um, finding organisms that tolerate uh, uh, marine environments. So um, it's fairly high sodium chloride levels. I don't think Saccharomyces likes uh, marine environments. But um, you know, again, that, that may be a, a way to take some of these solutions is to come up with, 
with some of those uh, innovations, right? You know, that's, that's the whole point of all these things from a research standpoint is finding things that no one's ever thought of before.